Hello, we are the 2011 Reduced Gravity Team from Washington University in St. Louis. We'd like to share our experiences from participating in NASA's Systems Engineering Educational Discovery Program. For our project, we measured the amount of carbon dioxide near a subject's face in a zero-gravity environment. Carbon dioxide poisoning is a problem aboard space shuttles, within the space station, and inside of spacesuits. While cabin monitors show that there is not too much carbon dioxide in the air, some crew members are experiencing symptoms of carbon dioxide poisoning, like breathlessness and dizziness, that can become very serious in even a short amount of time. We wanted to see if the air by a person's nose and mouth accumulates more carbon dioxide than ambient air in other parts of the cabin in both 0G and 1G. Participating in the Reduced Gravity Program gave us many opportunities for hands-on learning and experience in engineering and other areas. We worked with our mentors to design, fabricate, and build our experiment, giving us experience with computer design programs, project evaluation, machining, and the overall design process. We also honed our technical communication skills in the process of applying for funding and writing our proposal, detailed testing plan, and final report. After four months of planning and work in St. Louis, we hit the road to head to Johnson Space Center. Once in Houston, we met with our mentors and finalized our testing procedure. We presented our experiment to a team of NASA engineers who determined that our project was ready to fly. In addition to working on our experiment, we got to learn a lot about NASA. We got to go on a tour of Mission Control and see the life-size mock-ups of the Space Shuttle and International Space Station that astronauts use for training. We also had to pass physiological training before we were allowed to fly. In this video, Katie demonstrates how your body can get disoriented when you spin with your eyes closed. <laughs> After all of that, it was time to put our experiment onto the plane. In order to be allowed to fly, we did a detailed analysis to certify that our equipment would be secure during the flight. We attached our computers and carbon dioxide monitor to this plate after takeoff each flight. Our ambient monitor was on the other side of the plane so that people wouldn't get too close to it. Finally, the time had come for our reduced gravity flights. We got into our flight suits and were off. John, Alex, and Hans flew with our mentor, Jennifer, on the first flight. Katie, Andrew, and Christy flew with Jonathan, another one of our mentors, the second flight. Once we were in zero gravity, we measured the amount of carbon dioxide near the subject's nose as well as across the plane from the subject. John and Christy were our test subjects on the flights. Katie and Alex ran the program which collected the data about the carbon dioxide levels near the subject's face and made sure that the equipment was working properly. Andrew and Hans wrote down notes about the conditions during each of the 25 trials while monitoring the carbon dioxide levels across the plane from the subject. In addition, we took video of the subjects throughout the flights to use as we analyzed all the data we collected. This is a typical breathing waveform showing how much carbon dioxide is around the subject's nose and mouth. The downward slopes and troughs are when the subject breathes in, and the peak values are during exhalation periods. We found that the amount of carbon dioxide by the subject's face built up more in 0G than in 1G. However, there was not a significant rise in the ambient carbon dioxide levels in the cabin during the zero gravity periods. This trend suggests that the rise in carbon dioxide levels near the subject's face was due to an accumulation of carbon dioxide, not due to an overall rise in carbon dioxide levels throughout the cabin. Knowing more about the behavior of carbon dioxide and microgravity will help NASA in the future when they monitor carbon dioxide on the space station and build spacesuits. In addition to doing our research, we spent part of each flight working on materials for conducting educational outreach at elementary schools in St. Louis, Missouri and Charlotte, North Carolina. We showed how angular momentum works when there is no gravity using a wheel on handlebars. Ricky led a group that volunteered all semester at a local elementary school building gravity cruisers. We took videos of a toy car going down a ramp in different gravitational conditions to demonstrate the concepts he'd been teaching them. On top of everything we learned from doing research on the flights, we had an amazing time and made lifelong memories. We would like to thank the JSC Education Office and Reduced Gravity Office for making this opportunity available to us. We would also like to thank the Missouri Space Grant Consortium and Washington University for providing funding to make this opportunity feasible for our team and our advisor, Dr. Guy Jenin, for his support. Extra thanks to the Neuroimaging Laboratories of Mallinckrodt Institute of Radiology at Washington University School of Medicine and the Midwest U.S. Division of Biopack Systems for lending us carbon dioxide monitoring equipment. 
Finally, our NASA mentors, Jennifer, Jonathan, Philip, and Dr. Dave, were extremely supportive throughout the entire design, experiment, and reporting process. Without all of your support, this experience would never have been possible. Uh, zero gravity plane, signing off. Bye.